I think I've learned a lot about how to deal with failure and accepting that it's inevitable. At X, we talk a lot about failure because we work on moonshots. So by its definition, they are high risk and daring and audacious. So many of our projects fail, especially in the early stages. My job at X is to run Foundry, which is the earliest stage of X projects. I start several projects a year and about half of them close down again. So I am constantly starting new things and I'm constantly uh, thinking about you know, which ones should survive, which ones should close, etc. We set at the beginning of each project um, success criteria where we define what would happen in the world. How would the world be a better place if we're successful, right? What if we give internet to everyone in the world? What, what would that enable? But we also set very clear failure or kill criteria. And the beauty of that is if you agree those up front, and often the team writes their own, so I, I want them to write the list, if those criteria are then fulfilled, it becomes a much less emotional decision to close the project down, and it's a decision that the team can do themselves. So sometimes those are technical criteria, like we want a certain efficiency in a process, uh, sometimes they're economic. And the example where that worked really well was a team in, that was working on a new kind of fuel. The project was called Foghorn, and the idea was to make a carbon neutral fuel by extracting CO2 from seawater, combining it with hydrogen and, and making a fuel that you can burn in a conventional car. And when the car, when the car burns the fuel, the CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. So you have a sort of a closed carbon cycle. And the team focused both on technology. They made a lot of progress on the technical side. They actually built a prototype together with Xerox Park. I have a little vial of fuel that was made by the prototype that sits on my desk um, back at Mountain View. But they also had a kill criteria around the economics, which was we wanted to make the fuel price competitive with conventional fuel because nobody's going to pay three times as much for the petrol in their car. And that was actually the thing that killed the project because we started the project when the oil was at $100 a barrel and when oil hit $30 a barrel, the team looked at it and they said, we can never make these economics work. And so they decided to close down their own project. So what's interesting, I think, is what happens after that. So first of all, I gave them all a bonus um, for their brave decision to shut down their own project. And I remember when I first raised this, like the HR team said, really, you like rewarding them for failing? And I said, I'm rewarding them for the decision and for the rigorous analysis that went into this. The fact that the project didn't survive is besides the point. This is exactly the kind of behavior that I want to encourage and that kind of braveness and honesty that I want to encourage. Then they presented at an X all hands. They talked about all the reason, like, all the things they explored, all the reasons why the project wasn't going to continue. And afterwards, their colleagues came up to them and they said, that was incredibly honest and incredibly brave. Thank you for sharing these lessons. And then they also wrote it up um, as an article that they've submitted to a peer-reviewed journal. And so I have the secret hope that maybe this project is only deep frozen and not really dead because somebody might read that article and say, oh, here's an idea that you know X overlooked and here's how we could, could move it forward. <music> A startup is constantly living with the fear of running out of money and literally being obliterated entirely. So they try and get to something like a minimum viable product as fast as possible, even if that minimum product is a long way away from their original vision. We actually want to tackle the toughest problems first um, because we want to find out as quickly as possible whether it's possible to go all the way to the long-term vision. So that's, I think that's a sort of somewhat fundamental difference. And it's very counterintuitive because we are inclined as human beings to work on things that we know we can solve. We make some progress, we feel good about that. But to us, that doesn't make any sense because if you can find out quickly that this project is never going to work, that's better than spending a year solving all the easy problems to then fail on a you know, impossible problem a year in. 
And we have, I have an image for that. So we sometimes talk about uh, training a monkey on a pedestal. So imagine you want to train a monkey to recite Shakespeare while standing on a pedestal. Where do you want to spend your energy? Do you want to, do you spend your time building the pedestal or training the monkey? So in that example, it's very obvious that you should spend all your time training the monkey because you already know how to build the pedestal, but that's not what people do. How do we make the car drive itself? How can we make the balloon float a hundred days so it can actually provide internet connectivity in a meaningful way? But there's a meta moonshot in this, and that's actually building the moonshot factory itself. So we talk about X as a moonshot factory, and it's almost a deliberate contradiction in terms because people think you can't, you can't make a factory of innovation, right? Innovation is weird and special and unpredictable. We actually think that some of the aspects of innovation you can factorize. So that's both a process, like I sometimes think about the X as a moonshot factory. So I put small projects in at the beginning and then something pops out at the end, you know, like Verily, our life science company that spun out a year and a bit ago, or Waymo, which spun out of X at the end of last year. So there's definitely a sort of factory process for the, for the projects to go along it. But there's also factory processes in the sense that there's certain things that we've learned about how to run these kind of projects that um, we can apply to the next one. So my team is called Foundry. It's the early stages. Uh, so I constantly have projects starting. I constantly have projects moving on. And we've learned a lot, for instance, about the cultural transitions that the projects go through as they go from a research experiment in Rapid Eval, which is the team that thinks of new ideas that X should be working on, and all the way to a team like Waymo, which has become its own company. Right? And there's, there's different shocks that happen as you're going through these transitions, for instance. Just very concretely for me, like when I take new projects in, they switch mode. They switch from being sort of a research experiment that thinks a little bit about where might my market be, what product would I have, to running much more like a startup. While they're in Foundry, they have to think like startups. Who's my user? Why do they want this? What problem exactly am I solving for them? That whole sort of user and market view comes in during the Foundry stage, as well as progressing the technology and building a, a tech prototype. And how do you do that? And how do you get teams to go through those transitions? For instance, that's something to me that you can productize. Um, the other part is what I talked about, like how do you deal with failure, right? Like you can make very deliberate choices about not penalizing teams for failure, how to reward honesty um, and, um, and decouple some of the personal success from the project success. It's not that Europe can only learn from California. It's actually a two-way street. And there are certain things that California is not very good at that Europe could really bring to the table. One example is European cities have been growing for hundreds of years. Now, they have tons of experience of how do you live with millions of people in a very small space. So things like how do you optimize multiple different um, forms of transportation to coexist is something that a European city should be much better at than an American city, which primarily, there's a few exceptions, but primarily depends on cars to get people around. Right? But the starting point for the cities is very different. So we get these city planners from Europe come over and they say, we're writing the 2050 plan and we're going to try and imagine what the city of the future looks like. And please like, let us know what you think self-driving cars are going to do to cities. We have the American cities who come to us and say, hey, we hear you're looking for a pilot city. Why don't you come and try out your cars? We know they're not finished yet, but we're willing to take that risk. Right? So you have the you have the long-term planning and you have the very short-termism. -term if you can combine the two, right, it would be incredibly powerful. So it's only when we get both of these cultures more merged and have influences from both come together that I think we can solve the really big problems in the world. Top on my list would be climate change because that's one of those problems that's going to affect everything and everybody. And it's a very diffuse problem 
that can only be solved if multiple parties work together. So that's governments at all levels, it's companies, the technology companies, um, but also others. Otherwise, that's not going to be solved in our lifetime. And it's the kind of problem that if we don't solve it in our lifetime, like everything else will be lost and we might as well all go home. The um, another problem that's sort of somewhat related is actually food, food safety. You know, people always said Maltus was never right. Um, the, the agriculture always became more efficient before we ran out of food. But if you look at population growth uh, projections, we may actually run out of food. And there's certainly no way that we can produce meat in the same way that we are doing today and um, and a billion more people eat meat. It, it, it would also be like an eco-disaster for the planet. So these are the kind of problems that I think we'll have to, we'll have to solve um, in order to make a really big difference in the world. The other thing I think about a lot is like, what are the byproducts of the technology? So if you introduce technologies like automation into society, um, it produces fears. You know, people are afraid of moving, of losing their job. So how can we think about what the effects of that technology are, um, you know, not just five or 10 years down the line, but maybe 30, 40, 50 years down the line? So maybe the whole way we think about work will be very different, that we don't think I go to school and then I go to university and then I'm going to have a job for life. I mean, no millennials today think about a job for life in any case, but maybe we don't even think about picking a particular profession and sticking with that. I may be personally biased because I have a philosophy degree and I now run engineering teams. So that's a very long way away from what I originally studied in university. But I think that people, if they have the right agency, can reinvent themselves multiple times um, during their lifetime. So as a society, we have to think about like, what are the skills that we have to give them, or even just the attitudes, right? Like it's not about teaching someone coding. It's actually about giving somebody the ability to create their own destiny and think about what they're going to do next with their life.